Hello everybody, welcome back to Weekend Watch Repair. My name is Adam. On the bench today is an Elgin pocket watch from 1923. 100 years old this year. The watch on the left is a matching pocket watch given from my mother to my stepfather many years ago. The one on the right is the one we're going to be working on today. And the reason I showed those two watches together is because I got the pocket watch in that my mother gave to my stepfather. Um, it had taken a fall, had some damage done to it, had replaced a balance staff, several broken jewels, a lot of ex extensive repair work was done to it. And I've got it repaired and it's re ready to return to him. And my thought was that I wanted to get my mother a matching watch. So that way they could have a matching pair and have them side by side. And I just thought that would be a, a pretty neat project to do. So I sourced this watch and my goal was to pr have it ready for them for the upcoming holidays when I see them. So I could, when I return his watch to him, I could gift my mom this one. She doesn't know about this watch's existence. She doesn't know I'm doing this and she won't see this video until she, that watch has been returned to her and she has this watch in her hands. But, uh, I was telling her a while back that uh, working on watches was a hobby of mine. I told her about this channel and uh, to my knowledge, she's never really been too much into watches, but you know, I am her son. So uh, she's watched the videos and she's kind of learning. And we were talking recently and, you know, she was explaining some of the processes where she's starting to pick up on some of the things, some of the things and anticipating what we're going to be working on next. And here you can kind of see a, a gnarly little scratch there on that, gold case. The hands on these things are beautiful blued steel hands, but they're a bit dirty, a bit scratched up, uh, on the crystal all around the crystal. I saw these little bubbles and what those were, were dried up lubricant, uh, from when, or dried up adhesive for when they glued the crystal in. But we're going to put this thing on the time graph for initially just to see how it's running. And although it is running a bit fast, the beat errors not terrible. I mean, it's, it's as expected, but it needs to be better. The amplitude's low. That bottom trace line is a bit noisy. We may have an issue either on the escape wheel, escape wheel tooth, or maybe a really dirty, um, exit stone on the pallet fork. Not entirely sure just yet, but we'll, we'll get into that. So I'm going to remove the case back here and take a look and see how this thing's just running, just this is kind of first inspection on this thing. When I got this watch, uh, my timetable is actually really short. I, I, I got my stepfather's watch repaired a couple weeks ago. And when I came up with the idea, when I finally decided that I wanted to do this watch for my mother and surprise her with it, I only had a couple weeks before I was going to see them again. So when I was trying to find the watch with the exact same dial, same movement, um, you know, I tried to source a go as good of an example as I could. And, I found this thing and at first glance it, you know, it looks really clean and uh, I'm going to, we're going to remove power from the mainspring as I'm telling you this. So that's what I'm doing here. It looked real clean. Uh, the person who sold it said it had been recently serviced and it was running great. Although they, you know, most people don't have a time grapher. So I asked for those, but you know, generally you never get them. You, you never get them to provide you those. They don't have the machine. But I was, I'm, I'm suspect when they say a watch has been serviced just because you never really know. I've, I've certainly worked on watches that people say, oh, it was serviced last year, but it quit working or whatever. And, um, you know, the service is only as good as the person doing it. And although I'm, I'm not perfect, there's definitely some people who say a watch has been serviced and they may even pay for a service, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's done properly. And this watch here, although, you know, on face value, it looks really clean and pretty good and it is running, uh, it does have some gremlins that we will address. So we will get into those. So I'm pulled out the setting lever here and I'm just taking a look at the hand alignment. It looks good, but we're going to leave them at 12 o'clock there, put some plastic down and we can go ahead and remove these hands. And I was really wanting to do some hand restoration on these, but, uh, I ended up not going that route. I wanted to restore those hands. You can clean them up and then re-blue them. And it's something I want to attempt, but I just don't have everything I need to do it. So, and it's probably a good thing. I don't, I don't want to learn how to do it on this watch. So since it is a gift from my mother and really rather important to me that I get this done properly and I don't want to destroy, you know, a good set of original hands. So we're going to go ahead and flip this back over and open up the back again. I typically try to 
keep the either the case back on or the front on when I have it on the movement cushion whenever possible, depending upon what side I've got it laying down on. Here with this area, we can see we have a missing case screw. And I could feel when I was first holding the watch, it, it felt a little bit loose or a little bit of wiggle inside of it when I was winding it. And that is definitely why we're missing one of the two screws that, that, that secure the movement to the case. So we'll source one of those. And oddly enough, I went back when I found that I went back and looked at the eBay posting and in the pictures in that post, both screws were there. So I don't know what would have caused that screw to be, you know, not be there when I got it, but that was the case. I ended up not making too big a deal out of it. That screw was not terribly difficult to source. So we're going to go ahead and remove the movement from this case. And now we can remove the, or at least loosen the three dial feet screws. These screws just clamp on or, you know, put pressure on the dial feet. And that is what secures it to the movement. Once we got all of those loosened, then I can go through and just gently begin to work this up. The dial feet are a pretty tight fit inside this movement. So I'm just being extremely careful and just working that dial up around, you know, around the movement, just kind of working my way in stages. And when I get it popped up enough, I can go ahead and remove the dial. So this is a, an enamel dial, a split level enamel dial at that, which is pretty cool. And that enamel, that enamel is a really interesting process on how they do that. I'll explain that here in a minute. But first thing, there's a problem here on this movement, on this front plate that uh, I wanted to show you, that, that one of the first things I saw. And as you can see here, we'll zoom in and point an arrow at it. That hour wheel is just barely touching the pinion on that minute wheel. It's sitting way too high. And there's really only one thing that can cause that. And if we zoom in again, once we remove it, you can see that cannon pinion is not sat down fully. It's riding way too high as well. So it's a super easy fix. That cannon pinion just needs to be pushed down as long as there's no issues with the second wheel arbor or anything, but um, not a big deal. We can fix that. But yeah, on, that, the, on those enamel dials, I'll probably be corrected on this, but I believe they call it vitreous enameling. And what they do is they'll put an enamel paste on the back side of the dial. They'll use a substrate, usually brass as a base, and they'll put that enamel paste on the back of it and they'll put an enamel powder on the front of it and then put it in an oven and just bake it for lack of a better word at really high temperatures. I don't exactly remember the specific temperature, but it's, it's cooked really for a really high temperature. And what'll happen is that enamel powder on the face of the dial will melt and form this very flat surface. And when it's done cooking, <laughs> it will just form this beautiful, bright, lustrous white finish. And then they can, you know, print their, their markers on it, apply them however they want to apply them. And as a general rule, those enamel dials, as long as they're protected, it like being in a watch case or some other product that, you know, can protect it. It, it generally, they hold up really well. As you can see that that hundred year old dial looks basically as good as it did when it was made a hundred years ago. Uh, and porcelain or not porcelain, but enamel has a lot of cool properties. You know, it's not affected by ultraviolet light, all kinds of stuff. So as long as it can be protected, they generally hold up, but they can be prone to scratching or to cracking. So that's just one thing you have to take in mind. So as we're removing these parts that there was the spring for the yoke, and now we can remove the yoke itself. That's just held on by this one screw. And that yoke can come off. So yeah, this is not going to be the most complicated watch we've ever done, but on a personal level, for reasons I explained earlier, um, this one means a lot to me. It's probably one of the more important watches that I've done. So we got the movement flipped over and we're going to go ahead and pull this balance out to begin with. So I removed the screw and I'm just kind of putting a screwdriver underneath it to break any tension on it. And that will allow me to lift it up. Ooh, and it looked like that balance wheel had caught for just a moment, but we got it out of there. Now we can remove the crown wheel. And this crown wheel is held on by a reverse threaded screw. As you can see, it's not marked like you may have seen in a bunch of Seikos where the, the head of the screw may have three notches on it or something to indicate that it's a reverse threaded screw. This, These don't. Um, 
as a general rule on most of the crown wheels, they generally are reverse threaded screws. Not always, but most of the time. But we got the crown wheel out and there's the crown wheel center. Now we can remove our ratchet wheel held on by one screw. And really pretty decoration on these parts as well. I mean, I'm just super impressed with these old pocket watch movements. So we'll go ahead and pull the click spring out of the way. And I'll just use a bit of Rotico and we can remove our ratchet wheel. And on the underside of that ratchet wheel, you'll notice that square cut out. That, 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 that square keyed cut doesn't go all the way through, but that is what indexes onto the mainspring arbor. So we just make sure that that's in there when aligned properly when we reinstall it. And now we can remove our click. And this click is a real simple click, but you can tell, I mean, they, they embellish these parts. I mean, there's a, there's a, a chamfered bevel cut on there with a high polish on it. I mean, that's completely unnecessary. And generally only a watchmaker would ever, you know, or, or someone opening the case back would ever see that. It's completely not necessary to do, just like the shape of these springs. And these aren't terribly elaborate, but in some pocket watches, they really can be. They're just, you know, you could tell there was pride in craftsmanship when they made these. And there's nothing wrong, and I'm like with Seiko's, I'm a huge fan of Seiko, but it's just a different philosophy about making a timepiece where, you know, on, on these, it was, there was a lot of focus on, you know, embellishment and, you know, just craftsmanship. And even on stuff you'd never see, you know, screw heads that are inside the movement that will never see the light of day, even from the owner, unless they take the watch apart. They're really only ever seen by watchmakers, but they could have full polishes on them. It, accomplishes nothing other than, than just to say, you know, we did it a different philosophy, like on Seiko's and some other watches where more on engineering and design and they build extremely robust, reliable timepieces, but designed to be manufactured efficiently serviceable and everything else. So, and they're just two different ways of thinking about it. And neither one of them's right or wrong. And they both definitely have merits. So as we continue disassembly, that there's the third wheel. The pinion on that third wheel looks all right. The the lower the lower pivot actually I can see some markings on. I'm looking through my microscope here and it's zoomed in pretty far. And I can I can see some markings and stuff on there. So now we can go ahead and separate the stem from the sliding clutch and the winding pinion. Just like that. You know, we refer to these things in a lot of the videos as the keyless works. And where that comes from is old pocket watches, old timepieces required a physical key in order to wind it and perform some functions. And so when that, when they designed them to begin working without a key, where you just have a crown on the watch or, you know, um, the crown on this pocket watch case and didn't require an external key anymore, hence the name keyless works. That's why those parts have that name. So with that all pulled apart, we can go ahead and rem remove the pallet fork bridge that's held on by this one screw. And I saw that bridge kind of move a little bit as I was unscrewing it. It's somewhat surprising to see that on these because these parts have locating pins on the underside of it, little studs that index them into the proper position in the main plate. And a lot of times, especially on these old pocket watches, you can see how thick these plates are and the bridges are in this pallet fork bridge. Um, a lot of times those are really tight fit and that's great. I mean, it's just manufactured to very tight tolerances, even for a hundred year old watch. But a lot of times you really got to work hard to loosen them and work them very slowly to make sure you don't damage a pivot. But that one there came off easy. And now our, out comes our pallet fork. And this thing to me looks like a, an insect with antennas on it. <laughs> um, maybe if you know, you know, I'd really appreciate it if you could leave a comment if you happen to know the purpose of those things, if, I mean, if it's, if they're really just decorative or if they're, if they serve some function, like maybe some sort of a counterbalance to affect the way that that pallet fork, you know, rotates back and forth or something. I don't really know but um, that's quite an embellishment on that pallet fork. If it really is just decorative, but uh, if there is a purpose for it, please let me know. I really would like to know. Last to come off here is the train wheel bridge and there's two, an indexing pin on each side of this. So I'm just very easily, very gently working it back and forth until they both come loose and just taking a quick look to see if we can see anything 
wrong. And there actually is something wrong with this. We'll find it during closer inspection later. And then we can remove our fourth wheel and escape wheel. We'll check the pivots on those as we do it. You may, and you may have noticed on these plates, like the, uh, on that train wheel bridge plate I removed or the pallet fork bridge, the balance cock, the barrel bridge and the main plate all have serial numbers marked on them. And uh, generally speaking, you can kind of tell if all the parts or plates are in stuff are original to the watch because that'll have this, the, the movement serial number on each of those parts. And in this watch, they were. Yeah, that pallet fork, the lower pivot on that pallet fork on that one actually looked, it may not come through on the camera too well at that distance, but looking up super close to the microscope, there was some markings on it. But now we have all these jewels in the, in the bridges and the main plate. Uh, and so all of these that are capped jewels, we're going to go ahead and remove beginning here with the escape wheel. So we've removed the two screws holding that in and then push that jewel through, through the other side. And that jewel has two pieces. There's a setting and a capstone. And the setting is the one on the left here where the, where the hole in it, where the, the pivot's going to go through. And I'm taking a look at the condition of those. Again, this is the escape wheel and it doesn't look too terribly dirty, but it is a little bit dirty. So we'll move over here to the pallet fork and kind of speed up me unscrewing those and we'll press this out again. And someone will probably say it and they're exact. They're, they're absolutely correct. I probably should be using my staking tool for this, especially well, at least the pushers for the staking tool. I'm just using my jeweling tool cause I had it handy, but um, that didn't really hurt anything. No harm, no foul, but we get that removed and take a look at this under the microscope. And that one is dirtier than the one before that capstone. Definitely pretty filthy. And if we take a look at this setting, it's pretty dirty too. And then there's like a glob of old lubricant of some type around that seven o'clock mark. So yeah, just, they're just getting dirtier and dirtier. And now we can take a look at the balance and see if that's going to be any better. And, uh, I'll go ahead and let you know now it's, <laughs> it's not any better. <laughs> but we'll go ahead and press this out and then take a look at these as well. And so as you're looking at this, kind of keep in mind, you know, we saw that really low amplitude and definitely one of the factors that can affect that is these dirty jewels, especially here. Take a look at that balance jewel. If someone said they serviced it and this is running great, that is not proper service. And take a look at the glob of lubricant dried up at about the six o'clock position on that. That almost looks like a chip in the jewel. And it's kind of hard to distinguish between the two sometimes when they're really dirty, which we'll actually see here in a bit. Uh, that one there was just dried lubricant that did clean off. There's a cap jewel in the pallet fork bridge as well. And it can be kind of, that screw there is very small and it can be kind of difficult to, to get out, but we'll go ahead and separate those. And the pallet fork bridge has an awkward shape and I, I really should have gotten my staking tool out and used that, but uh, I just used the pusher and pushed it out manually. So that came out. As a general rule, you need to run these dry unless specifically stated by a certain, you know, a particular documentation on a specific movement, but that's just terrible, especially for a watch they claim was running super good. So as I was looking at these, that's always kind of in the back of my mind, but there's also a capped jewel in the balance bridge. And in order to get to that, we need to go ahead and remove the balance wheel off of the bridge. So what we're doing here is loosening the hairspring stud screw. And once that's loosened, I didn't really get it good on film, but you can flip that over and then that, that they separate. And then as long as the, the hairspring doesn't get caught up in the regulating pins, it'll, it'll just kind of fall out. You can kind of nudge that stud a little bit to help it. But I put the bridge back in the main plate and use that to support it. Uh, generally I would never do this with a pocket watch or with a wristwatch. And with this, this bridge is pretty thick on the pocket watch and I'm using hardly any pressure when I'm unscrewing it but it just makes it easy to do. I just don't want to press down hard and potentially bend that bridge. But now we get those out and then take a look at that capstone. That almost looks like the same thing where it's a glob of dried up lubricant. And I wasn't exactly sure at first. So we'll pull that aside and take a look at it here in a minute to confirm. And we'll just take a look at this capstone. And yeah, it's just not that, not that great. You can see how those jewels are also held in there by, uh, the brass, they call, they call these rubbed in jewels. So I'm just using some peg wood to kind of go over this just to check. And sure enough, that is a chipped jewel. 
So we need to source a new one of those, unfortunately. And that is actually the first of three damaged jewels that we're gonna find in this watch. So here's my replacement. And as you can see there, that, that jewel there is super clean and undamaged. So thankfully we were able to source all the jewels we needed. Here's the second one that was cracked. This is the jewel in the barrel bridge for the center wheel. And as you can see there at the, about the two o'clock position, when we shine a light underneath it, you can see the crack in that jewel as well. So unfortunately that's got to get changed. And then also lastly, it was the setting jewel for the escape wheel on the train wheel bridge was also damaged as well. So that one's going to be replaced as well. So now we can go ahead and separate out our mainspring barrel. So once we get it released, we'll go ahead and remove that lid and ugh, looks, we got Vulcan grease. <laughs> but you, you know what? I'm a Star Trek fan. Vulcans have green blood. That was a good joke. So sue me. <laughs> but take a look at all that. I mean, that is a, a that's a ton of lubricant. And B, if that is some sort of specific grease that, uh, you know, that I've just never seen the green grease before. So if that is something used in this type of work, I just don't know what that grease is. So please let me know. Otherwise, it looks like they just got old jello or something in there. It's just, I don't know what it is. So as I'm unwinding this mainspring, I can see the cone forming and take a look at this spring. <laughs> that might be able to be repaired. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I'm, it's going to be replaced. So we can go ahead and we got most of the parts here that we're going to put through the cleaning machine. Uh, what's not listed here is the pallet fork and the balance wheel and then all the screws. I keep those screws organized by part. Now I clean those manually while the, the machine's going. It, uh, it doesn't take long, but it just my, my method of keeping things organized. It's a bit overkill probably, but it works for me and I don't misplace, you know, I, I, I don't mix up screws as a general practice. It's something I started when I first started out and I just kept doing it. So now we can go ahead and clean this machine. The first stage is going to be a wash followed by three rinse cycles and then a drying cycle. And while that's going on, I'm also taking a look. This is the balance complete before it goes into cleaning. And I'm just double, I'm just kind of taking a closer look at it. There is a bunch of crud on that impulse jewel. The pivots, you know, they've got some, you know, they're somewhat dirty. There's some marks on it. They don't look pristine, but the hairspring looks great. That, that curve you've seen there, that awkward curve is called a brigade over coil. Pretty cool. So after multiple rounds of cleaning, and trying to scrub that impulse jewel and all that and dips in one dip. This is the final one. So we'll go ahead and get that out of there. And then I'll just use a puff of air and gently, very gently, just assist in the quick evaporation of that one dip solution. But that one dip is safe for shellac parts. So it won't, you know, it won't damage the shellac holding the impulse jewel on or the, the stones on the pallet fork. But taking a look at this thing up close, you can see now those those pivots look really great. That impulse jewel cleaned up beautifully. Um, the stones on these are clear. And that may seem odd. Uh, generally, they're red, but that red is just part of, they do that intentionally during the manufacturing process. And, you know, that you can make a jewel technically, you can make them blue or whatever, but um, these are clear. You know, the composition of that, you know, it's, it's the exact, it, it's, Sapphire still. We're taking a look at this pallet fork and we did the same cleanup work on that on the faces and on the sides of those stones where they lock and unlock too, just making sure those were impeccably cleaned. But everything came out of the cleaners and now we can go ahead and get these jewels reassembled. This here is the replacement setting for the escape wheel. This one, the original one was damaged. So we're pressing in its replacement into the bridge. That one sits in pretty deep actually. Here we go. We got that pressed in. We need to lubricate this jewel before we put it in. I'm electing not to use my automatic oiler on these. It would be easier, but I just putting some 9010 on this jewel and just a little dot of it there. Um, there we go. That looks pretty good. We need to flip this over and then put it into the setting in the bridge making sure that we don't disturb that oil while we do it, unfortunately. And I kind of messed with this a little bit. It didn't go in as smoothly as I'd like, but thankfully it didn't disturb that oil. But once you get it set into place, 
you can take a look in those jewels. And if you see that the oil has kind of smeared around, well, that you basically have to start over, clean it, remove it, clean it, then start over completely again. And um, the automatic oiler makes that work easy. You just assemble it dry and then you can oil it from the backside. But that tool is a luxury and not a necessity. And I just haven't done one of these in a while since I've had that tool, but I've done way more watches this way than with that tool. But I just elected to do it that way on this, on this watch. Next up here, we can install our replacement center wheel jewel. Uh, this one's not a capped jewel, but it was damaged. So uh, if this thing wasn't broken, we would never have needed to remove it for the service. But that one's held on by three screws. I'm just making sure that I'm not over tightening these. I definitely don't want to strip any threads in these parts. But now I can we can get the settings in place for the escape wheel and the pallet fork and the balance wheel. And as you see me kind of fumble around and try to get these settings kind of in place, these jewels are not universal fit. They are specific to their locations. So um, what I do is when I'm taking them apart, I, I store them in separate bins and label what each one is. The, the, the stone, the capstones, the settings, and the screws. So just to make sure that all those parts go back in in the same exact order that they were before. Because the the pivot hole in the jewel size is special, you know, specific to that part, uh, the size of the jewel, the size of the setting, everything. So this here is the capstone for the escape wheel. And we need to lubricate that with some 9010. We'll flip that over and push that down into place. Just like that. Next up is the capstone for the pallet fork. And as general practice, you, you run those dry. And as previously mentioned, if you are working on a specific movement that the manufacturer gives specs to, to use a specific lubricant, you know, that's, that's, that's one matter. But as a general rule, those are left dry. So we'll put some 9010 here on the balance capstone and go ahead and flip that around. We'll index this so that those relief cuts for the screws are aligned properly. And now we can go ahead and get all six of these screws tightened for each of these. There we go. Now we'll remount the balance bridge onto the main plate and there's our replacement jewel for the balance. I'll go ahead and just gently press that down. That new, that part looks beautiful. And one last time here, applying some 9010 to the capstone for this jewel. Trying to get about 50% and maybe just a hair more coverage, but about 50% coverage on that jewel. We'll flip it up and turn it around and try to install this thing without smearing that oil everywhere. <laughs> but there we go. That one went in pretty good. We'll go ahead and straighten it up here. And try to seat it down. Failed on my first attempt. There it goes. And then as I'm screwing this down again, I'm using very, very light pressure. It looks like a lot because we're zoomed in pretty far, but uh, very light pressure. We'll go ahead and tighten those down and same process again for the pallet fork. <laughs> you know, they tell you on these pocket watches, you know, if you're going to start working on them, I, I read it a lot of times, you know, you should work on pocket watches to start. And as a general rule, I understand they are bigger, but you know what? These pocket watches, I've, this is again, not a complicated repair. I mean, broken jewels are, you know, it's, it's a essential repair, but, uh, we didn't have to, you know, major giant issues with this. And so, but I mean, a lot of pocket watches I've worked on, man, they've got problems. And from my perspective, I'm, uh, I'm of the opinion you should, you know, start out on something else. Sometimes, sometimes these, the ones I've worked on would have steered me away from watch repair if that's what I learned on. <laughs> so re reinstalling this balance wheel to the, to the bridge, we got the hairspring stud aligned in there. And now what I'm trying to do, the, the the coil that goes between the regulating pins was just slightly sitting on top. So I am just with the absolute lightest touch I can possibly do. Getting that set in between the two regulating pins. I'm sure there's people in the comment, they're freaking out. And I you cannot believe you're doing it that way. I'm not going to disagree with you one bit. Um, but I'm just doing my absolute best not to, you know, bend that spring in any way and change its shape. But everything went in fine. And now... I'm just very carefully going to come in here and tighten down a hairspring stud screw. And generally what I like to do, because sometimes you got to raise and lower that stud in there to 
you know, make certain adjustments. And on these, what I've generally found is I'll take a look at the position of that stud in there before I start and see where it is. But generally I get the top of the stud aligned with the top of the bridge as a starting point. If, if I don't have that info and then adjust from there if necessary. So this, what we're, we're attempting to take a look at what our beater is going to be. And you can see that shaft for the pallet fork in between those two banking pins. And ideally you want that to be dead center. And I'm trying to minimize beat error before we get this watch running just to adjust, you know, avoid adjusting it a dozen times over. It's really easy to see right now. So if you take a look here, uh, we need to turn the collet for this hairspring to the right. And you'll see just the tiniest bit of movement here. Right there. And I'll go ahead and reinstall this thing and see what that did. But now I, I find it at this stage, it's easier to make, to see where that is. And that's exactly why we have the pout fork pre-installed on here is just to see where, it, where it sits at a rest. So, and I just make those adjustments now. So, and one thing I, I found it difficult to learn which way to, you know, identify which way to turn it. And so as we take a look at the second attempt here, you can see it moved over to the right a little bit, but to my eye, it's still slightly too far to the left. So I'm going to make one more adjustment, but if you, you can see that mainspring barrel there, there's the hook inside the mainspring barrel where the mainspring is going to sit. But if you turn the collet in the opposite direction of the way it needs to move, it'll move in the right direction. So this is our replacement mainspring. And you may be wondering why it's not in a washer. <laughs> well, I expected it to be when I ordered it. And when I got the package and I opened it up, the spring popped out and I, for, I've never seen it happen, but it came out of the washer during shipping or something, I don't know. And when I opened up the package, it, it greeted me, uh, very, um, you know, very viciously, but no harm, no foul. The mainspring looks good. So we're going to go ahead and use it. I cleaned it because it's a new old stock mainspring. So I cleaned up all the old lubrication, re-lubricated it. Like you saw there, it had some lubrication inside the that cloth and I applied it. And then this is a, you know, a large pocket watch mainspring. So when you apply it just with that, applicator before it puts just the slightest, very slight film on it. I wanted just a hair more, but nothing to the level of what was on this watch when we, when we started. So I'm just putting a little bit more here. And this thing, as this thing gets wound and unwound a few times, it'll distribute that around. So I'm using, I'm, I'm lubricating the inside post there where that arbor is going to sit. And as we put in this arbor, you can see where that hook is going to sit inside that eyelet of the mainspring. There we go. But as, as I was applying that lubrication earlier, I, you know, I realized, well, I did enough. Like if this thing was a regular wristwatch, but this is a pocket watch and these things are a little bit bigger. And so I, I wanted to add a bit more lubrication. So we'll get this thing reassembled or put back together and I'll, I'll put a bit more on it from the outside. But here comes the barrel lid and there's a cutout in that barrel lid where it aligns with that, a T slot on the mainspring. So we just get that index properly. Then I go ahead and press it into place. I'm sure you've seen it a hundred times, so we won't show it here, but I'm taking a look at it underneath the microscope just to make sure that barrel is flush all the way around. And that thing is looking great. So now I'm going to go ahead and uh, apply a bit more lubrication to the that bottom arbor port. There we go. And then I'll have a little bit more oil on the oiler and I'll do the top side here as well. And there we go. And when all of those assemblies finally put back together and cleaned and jewels done and everything else, we can actually put this watch together. <laughs> so we'll start off here with the pallet, with the escape wheel and the fourth wheel, just making sure that that long pivot on that goes through that jewel. And I'll just place this bridge on. I generally like to do these by hand if I can. One of the tricks I learned when doing that, my stepfather's watch is I found it much easier to, I put the, the, the main bridge, the three quarter plate on first and did all that. And then I found this one very difficult to get the pivots aligned and everything moving around. So uh, lesson learned. And so when I did this, when I installed this side first and it went much, much easier pivots got aligned real easy and then we'll get it all tightened down. And I'll just give it a puff of air here. And that thing's just spinning freely, beautifully. looks great. Now we need to get the keyless works parts, the, the stem, the, sliding clutch and the winding pinion assembly in. So I'm putting some heavier grease on the plate here. We're 
some of those parts are going to make contact. And one more the tip over here where the end of that stem is going to go. And I pre-lubricated the stem with some grease. And now we are putting on our winding pinion. And we'll just get that put into place and up on that shoulder. And now our sliding clutch. Very fuzzy microscope footage there, but you get the idea. There we go. So now we can go ahead and pop this into place. As we get that in and start assembling the train wheel bridge, beginning with this third wheel. There we go. Get that put in. I was uh, kind of hoping this video comes out well. Uh, during editing, I, there's, I don't know, like I'm, I'm not the a world expert on any sort of editing of any manner, but uh, I, I, the my editing software forced me to do an update. And since I've done that update, everything moved on me first. All the buttons and all that stuff, it's all changed. So I've had to relearn how to do a bunch of stuff and it takes me way longer. Actually, I'll continue that here in a minute. So we're going to put on this train, this uh, three quarter plate here. And when we put it on, it's going to sit kind of high and the pivots for the second wheel and the third wheel are not going to be in place. So I'm going to do the, the, the tapping test and take a look at this, watch this plate drop. It happened real fast right there. I don't know if you caught it, but you may want to rewind it. That's what's great about these old pocket watches. Uh, they have their downsides as far as challenges go and parts availability, but the pivots are rather large. So if you need to, find their holes, the tapping trick works great on these. So we'll get this thing tightened down and all the screws put into place. But uh, yeah, so I was, you know, as I'm, as I'm editing this thing, it, uh, the, the screen is kind of glitching and it's just, it, it's just, I, I don't know. It's just weird and off. So I'm hoping this video renders out good. So if you do see a few little weird things, I don't really know what's causing it. I I've sent inquiries to customer support and I've gotten nothing but crickets. So uh, I'd rather not name the company, but um, it's a rather large one. But like, it's just like, I don't know why they decided to do that, but they did. And so like my whole process has changed. I may be shopping around for and learning a new editing platform. Uh, so at some point moving forward, but hopefully this thing turns out well. So we got the click into place and you saw me grease a few points there and then apply some lubrication here to the barrel arbor before we put our ratchet wheel on. There we go. And again, we have that square relief cut on the underside of that ratchet wheel. So we'll just make sure that index is properly. And at first this ratchet wheel doesn't want to go into place because the, the click is kind of in the way. So we'll pull that click back. And then that, there we go. The square kind of found its position and that thing dropped into place. So we can go ahead and screw this on. Just like that. And then I'll just use a bit of Rodico and I saw a little speck of something. Here we go and just make sure that's all nice and shiny. Now there's a lot of friction in this crown wheel in a few places. So I'm gonna wind, put some heavier grease on the winding pinion here where it's gonna interact with the crown wheel. Up top on the, you know, up top on the sides uh, around that center post there where the Ratchet wheel center is going to go. We'll go ahead and put our, or the crown wheel center, and we can put our crown wheel in. There we go. And uh, another small dab on each side of the inside ring of that crown wheel, where the crown wheel center is going to go, because the crown wheel is going to rotate, but the center is not. So there's going to be some friction in there. We just want to make sure we have some lubrication in there for that. We can pop that center down and put in our re reverse threaded screw. you can see two little spots on that center. Um, again, I wasn't sure if those wanted to remove or not. It turns out those are, that was not dirt. That's just a mark on it. So we'll go ahead and wipe that down. And I want to be able to, to wind this watch and get the keyless works and all that functioning before moving forward with the backside of the movement. So we're going to go ahead and put these parts together real quick. And I'm applying some heavier grease to the inside faces of that relief cut in the Sliding clutch where the yoke is going to sit. We can put in our yoke. Here we go. A little bit of lubrication here. Where the head of that screw is going to go down because it's going to rotate around that screw. 
and we can put in the rest of our springs here. And this spring here is going to be for the setting lever. And this one here is going to be for the yoke. So I'm going to hold this one down with my tool and go ahead and tighten it. And I've got it on the opposite post of where it's eventually going to set on the, on the yoke itself, but I have it that way so that I can apply some grease to the mating faces of the yoke and then the post on the, or to the post on the yoke and then to the, the contact face of the spring. And now we can kind of put that spring into place. Just like that. And I'll just use a bit of Rotico to clean up the excess. And there we go. This right here is the contact face where the setting lever post is gonna contact on that left side of that spring. So applying a dab of grease there and we'll put the setting lever into place. Hold it on, I'll just rotate it around a little bit to that post finds its spot. Boom, you saw it kind of drop down there. Looks easy, it took me a while to figure that one out on my stepfather's watch <laughs> before I figured out the easy way to install that part. But now that's in place and uh, Lastly, a bit more grease here on a few points where it's going to make contact with the yoke and just a few places here. There we go. Now we can just give it a test and make sure that it feels good. Nothing's binding up that it springs back into its first position. That looks great. One last cleanup on this side. Now we can apply some heavy grease to the center stud for our second wheel where our cannon pinion is gonna go. We can press down our cannon pinion and I'm gonna make certain that it's actually pressed down all the way. And there we go, no problems. A little po lubrication for the post on the mini wheel. Sorry, my hands were in the way of the main camera or one of them and the other one was terribly out of focus and that microscope, I wasn't planning on using that footage, but. There you go. Uh, that that's what we're stuck with. So <laughs> anyways, I would like to take this opportunity just to say thank you to the patrons of this channel for real, a heartfelt thank you. A special shout out to Cole and Tony or two of newest members. I appreciate you so much for joining. Uh, but it's just something we created. Uh, I, I sure appreciate anyone who goes over there and takes a look. Uh, you can see a link on your screen there. There's also some information in the description. I'm trying my best to, to be kind of active on there and uh, will plan on uploading some patron only content, but I really appreciate the support everyone has shown. It, it helps the channel out a bunch and thank you very, very much. So now you can see me putting, we got the pout fork into place and we'll go ahead and put this bridge down and that bridge actually fell right into place uh, so easily so that I was concerned that actually the pivot wasn't in its home. So I'm just, Checking movement of that pallet fork right now, and it's moving freely. Once we get this in all the way, we can go ahead and put some wind in the watch, which I don't really show, but we got some wind in it. And now we can apply some special lubrication to the exit stone on that and apply that to five teeth at a time. And we'll repeat that process twice more. And now we can put in our balance and see what this thing wants to do. So we get that bottom pivot in its home and rotate it around and nothing. <laughs> See how that balance is kind of moving and then coming to an abrupt stop right there. That's over banked. It's on the, it's on the outside of the pallet fork. So I'm going to lift it up gently and move it to the other side of the pallet fork. And then there we go. So no big deal. That thing is going to start to come alive and uh, really you can, can't see much. It's, it looks actually really good, but once we get the screw tightened down and that thing secured, then we can really actually take a look at it and see what it looks like. Also taking into account, we haven't lubricated our train or trainer wheels yet or half of them at least, but at first glance, that balance wheel looks great. That coil is breathing beautifully and symmetrically and it just, it, everything's even and looks great. So that's all wonderful. And we can go ahead and lubricate our train wheel bridge. Just anything that we haven't already Address So any of the, the non-cap jewels we can address here on each side of the watch. There's that extended pivot for the fourth wheel and then the third wheel, and then we'll finish up with the escape wheel. So let that run. 
And so, ladies and gentlemen, so I this this is honest to goodness, honest to goodness. This is thirty minutes after I after I finished oiling it. I wanted to put it on the time grapher just to see what the readings looked like. But it was so cool, so special, and so good. I immediately just got the camera back out, and this is exactly what it looks like. I have not made any adjustments whatsoever. And take a look at that beat error. I mean, 0, 0.0. Did we 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 nailed it? <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, the, the, all the pre adjustments. We 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 got lucky. I was hoping it would be close, but we got real lucky. So I turn it to the dial up position, which is upside down, and now we're at crown up. And everything's staying pretty consistent. A little bit of an amplitude drop, but that's to be expected. And when we move it to crown down, it runs a little bit slower, but that's just fantastic. We can dial that in beautifully. I'm, I'm just extremely pleased with the results and that I don't have to remove that balance five more times to keep adjusting that beat rate. So good stuff all the way around there. So while that's running in for the next few days and I'm going to time it, get it regulated. I'm sorry for the very poor quality lighting here. I'm and the garage and uh, it's just under fluorescent light, but I've got a very soft cotton cloth mop and I'm just going to apply some red rouge. And this is not a buffet. This is just the lightest polish on the softest wheel I have. So all this is going to do is just shine up the case a little bit. Um, I'm going to go real light here and make a couple passes and I just want to see the difference. And again, I know this lighting does not make it ideal to, to show, but you can kind of see it just, it takes, the dull kind of finish off that and just kind of glosses the case up a little bit. It doesn't remove any scratches, anything like that, but i um, just going to, yeah, you can kind of see it. I'm just going to kind of go through each part here. I'm not going to show the full process, but I'll just show me working on each individual part just for a few moments, but um, I'll work this around and just try to clean up each of these things and make this case look nice and shiny. There we go. And so I bring it back to the bench here. Uh, this is after I finished it. I haven't even cleaned it yet. You can see my, <laughs> my filthy hands and I've got some fingerprints and smudge marks on the case, but it just, it looks a lot better. It's nice and shiny, but uh, this is going to go and go into an ultrasonic bath and get super clean and um, be ready to go. So that's great. So after I finish kind of dialing in the watch over a few days, I'm time to install the dial and get this thing finished up. So I'm applying some lubrication to the outside of the cannon pinion so we can put on our hour wheel and just when I put it on. I'm just making sure that it is flush with the pinion on that minute wheel. And that looks fantastic. And there is our dial washer. And now we can install our dial. Just making sure that those dial feet are aligned and that they get find their home. So there we go. That's all seated down properly. And we'll just tighten these three dial feet screws. And one of the things I had read, and thankfully this has never happened to me, but I mean, enamel dials can crack. And so what I've heard was if you crank down and put too much pressure on the dial feet, it puts pressure on the dial feet and thus the dial and it can put, make small cracks. So I'm just snugging them up and those dial feet are a pretty tight fit inside that movement. So that thing's nice and secure trying to clean up any little spot I see on that dial, but it's in beautiful shape. And now we can go ahead and reinstall it back into our nice clean case. So just working around, I'm going to flip it over here. It'll find its final position. I'm just going to hold it like this because I don't want to rest it on a movement pad on the dial. Because at this point I haven't gotten, I'm still waiting on the crystal to come in at the time of filming this part of it, but we'll get these two screws in. And as you see there, we found, I forgot my replacement screw. So now this watch properly has two screws holding it in. So it'll be nice and secure. And just like every other part, I'll get both screws in. Then I'll go back in and just snug each one of them up. Now we can put our case back on that case back has some sort of floral pattern on it. I mean, this watch has definitely seen where it's a hundred years old, but it looks really nice. And now we can move forward to installing our hands. So we'll go ahead and get the, our hand put on first. And one thing I learned while doing this, I'm just got, a, got some plastic covering out. I need to buy some more, some larger pushers, deeper pushers. Um, it, I got it on using the pusher. I had to, you know, 
do it a few times to get it to seat down all the way. But we'll go ahead and move this hour hand around. You can put this on in any location and then just rotate it around until it gets to 12 o'clock. We don't have a date complication to, to worry about any rollover. Now we can do our minute hand. And try to get that as centered as possible and in line with the hour hand. And we'll go ahead and put some plastic down and press that one into place as well. Just like that. Now I can just give this thing a, a test and rot rotate this around, make sure that all the, the, we don't have any clearance issues and everything's looking like it should. And we'll bring this back to 12 o'clock here and check the position of these hands. Right there. And that looks pretty good to me. So now we can install our seconds hand and just make sure the post on that seconds hand is on that fourth wheel pivot and just very light pressure. What did Bob Ross say? He said, uh, two hairs and some air. <laughs> That's the amount of pressure that I'm trying to achieve when pressing that down, but just very light, very light. Then I'll rotate them around and make sure everything's good to go. So I'm probably going to get roasted in the comments here because I'm not using the proper technique or tool to install this crystal, but I've got some GS hypo cement in the, in the bezel and I'm compressing that crystal with the smaller die on the bottom and a larger die on top and squeezing that crystal inwards and bringing that bezel up. Once I get it into place and feel it kind of in the slot, I'll release tension on it and that'll expand that crystal out and fill that up. So now we have a replacement crystal. Uh, generally the bottom stumps on those are like a hard or, or like a softer rubber thing that you bend the crystal around. I just use the plastic dies and they, they seem to work okay, but I don't have the, the proper tool to do it. Uh, unless Rober wants to send me a press and a die set. Um, you know, I, I can't justify that cost right now because my cheap Amazon, you know, part works fine. So we got a new chain on there and take a look at this watch, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if, Hang around for the last sh sh shot because uh, I got something really cool I wanted to show you. You'll you'll enjoy seeing it. But uh, just take a look at a couple shots here. This watch completed. I think it turned out beautifully. Uh, I'll go ahead and bring my stepfather's watch back out here, and we're going to deliver these together. You can see his on the left and my mother's on the right, and they're both keeping just impeccable time. I just could not be happier with how they turned out. And this last shot here, I've removed the case backs. And we're going to slow the video down here and take a look at these balance wheels. They were not beating in sync when I first brought them together. And after about 20 seconds of being together, they started to go into sync. You know, resonance probably playing a factor here, but I just thought that was super cool. So yeah, just, I was just playing around. I thought that shot was neat. I thought you might like to see it. So ladies and gentlemen, that is the video. I really appreciate you taking the time to watch it. If you like the content and want to like and subscribe, I sure would appreciate it. And uh, mom, you're probably still watching. Um, by now you have the watch and I certainly hope you enjoy it. Take care, everyone. I appreciate it so much. We'll see you on the next one.